Hello, and welcome to the React for Change educational series. Today's workshop is brought to you by Thought Partner Solutions in partnership with Sustainable T CT. Today, we'll focus on belonging, equity, diversity, and inclusion for municipalities. Please take a moment to review our notices and disclaimers, in particular highlighting that today's presentation is intended for educational purposes only. Thought Partner Solutions is an organizational leadership development firm that was founded by Jamal Jimerson. The organization offers consulting, training, and coaching through a humanistic and process-oriented approach with equity at its center. Today's workshop focuses around the lead model of leadership, equity, awareness, and development. My name is Naomi Moise, and I will be your workshop facilitator for today. I'm the CEO of an organization called Restoratively Speaking. I'm also a REACT specialist for Thought Partner Solutions. I'm a native Norwalker, a reader, lover of sunsets, crafting and brunch. I'm so excited to share in today's workshop with you and look forward to this journey. So today's desired outcomes of our workshop and our time together. I hope that this workshop is thought provoking, that it triggers your insights, it opens your mind to new beliefs, new facts, new perceptions, really establishes your role as an effective leader in helping bring Betty efforts forward. And Betty stands for belonging, equity, and inclusion. My hope is that you'll leave today with critical principles to lead inclusively. You'll be able to manage challenges, create effective and productive relationships with everyone. I hope you leave with an increased insight. So aha moments or takeaways about how your role, your responsibility, your identity and power can truly facilitate transformational change. I hope that you'll have personal reflections and actions for enhancing Betty and multicultural competencies and leading your team through the same journey. As we go through today's workshop, please take some time to pause, reflect, and really do some introspective work as we go through. For today's workshop, I've got a list of some ground expectations or some etiquette that I'd have for all of you. The first and foremost is self-care. Take care of your physical and emotional needs throughout this workshop. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about topics that are gonna be thought provoking, going to require some reflection and some looking inward. So please take the time that you need to pause and take body and brain breaks. I would like for you to create an environment where you can focus. So silencing your personal devices, setting yourself up in a quiet location, avoid checking email, the phone, website, Amazon, and finding ways to stay connected. I know through the pandemic, we've all found ways to multitask and we've become masters at it. But try to avoid those Google chats, the Microsoft Teams, and separating yourself from the workshop today. Please have some pen and paper or journal handy as there will be moments throughout the workshop where we'll pause and ask for a reflection. Think about things that you wanna remember, write down things that have challenged your thoughts, and think about things that you can bring back to your work in your communities. To get us going, we're gonna start with a video that centers around the importance of knowing our why. So the, the series is called, How Do I Know? And a lot of times when people hear the phrase, how do I know, the next thing they say is what? How do I know what? But the key really isn't to know what, the key is to know why. Because when you know your why, you have options on what your what can be. For instance, my why is to inspire people to walk in purpose. My what is stand-up comedy. My what is writing books. My what can be going out with some friends to eat. In fact, another what that has moved me towards my why is a, a web series that we have out now called Break Time. So every Wednesday at three o'clock, you should subscribe to the, to the channel. Uh, we do a series called Break Time on YouTube. So three o'clock, we drop a new episode. One episode in particular, I'm about to show you a clip to, we were in, uh, we in Winston-Salem. So Break Time, this is how it works. 
I travel the country, I do stand-up comedy, probably an hour, hour and a half at an event. And in the middle of my show, I'll just sit down and start talking to the audience. And funny just happens. Or I'll meet somebody who's really interesting. So I met this one guy, and he said that he teaches music at a school. I was like, all right, you teach music, you know, um, can you sing? And then uh, I'm just gonna show you the clip, check it. So you're a musical director. Cool. Yes, sir. All right, so um, let me get a couple. Let me get a couple bars of like uh, "Amazing Grace." Can you do the first part of that? Let me, go ahead. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Wow. That brought could sing. You know what I'm saying? All right, all right. Um, now, once you give me the version, is if uh, your uncle just got out of jail, you got shot in the back when you was a kid. I'm just saying, let me see the hood version real quick. If you know which version I'm talking about, just see if that exists. Let me see what you got. Amazing. So here's the thing. The first time I asked him to sing, he knew what he was doing. The second time I asked him to sing, he knew why he was doing it. When you know your why, your what has more impact because you're walking in or towards your purpose. I'd like you to take a moment to pause the video about two minutes and take some time to journal your reflections and thoughts on watching that video. Thank you for pausing and welcome back. I would like for you to take a moment and think about your beliefs, your values, and what brings you to this space today. In your journal, I want you to answer these two prompts. Why am I here? My why for being in this workshop today? And what are the most significant issues affecting my community today? So take about two to three minutes and pause this video so that you have an opportunity to journal the two questions, really thinking about what brings you to this space. As the comedian Michael shared, what is your why? It's different to know your what, but what is your why? I'll see you in a few moments. Okay, welcome back. So we are gonna be focusing on some power definitions. And the purpose of power definitions are they help us to ground ourselves in our understanding of the language. So when we're talking about belonging, we're talking about the feeling and the sense of acceptance. When we say equity, we're talking about structurally and systemically having access to opportunities and the resources that people need in order to thrive. When we talk about diversity, we're talking about how people from different demographics experience the community differently. Think outside of your own lens. What does somebody else need? And what is somebody else, what could this look like for someone else? And when we're talking about inclusion, we're ensuring that all social identities are integrated into the dynamics, the leadership, and the decision-making process. So I want you to take a moment and look over the four definitions shared 
and really ground yourself and think about your understanding of this language before we move on. So the first power definition that we're gonna focus on is belonging. It is the feeling of security and support when there's a sense of acceptance, inclusion, and identity for a member of a certain group or place. Belonging is important because we need human interaction as social beings. When we feel trusted and respected, we can speak freely and voice our opinions. Belonging encourages mutual support and it helps us to form bonds. So as you see on the chart here for Maslow's hierarchy of needs, our foundation is based in our basic needs. So things like food, water, warmth, shelter, security, safety. But the next step up is the psychological needs. And that starts with belonging and love. The feeling of having relationships, friends, a sense of belonging, a sense of community, a sense of connectivity. So really thinking about, are we meeting those needs for the people in our community? Is there anybody that's not getting the physiological needs that they need in order to feel a part of this community? Is there anybody not having their safety needs met? And if so, are we really creating a space of belonging? Are we really helping people to feel like they are a part of our community? Please take a moment to pause here and journal a few thoughts on the power definition belonging. Okay, so we're gonna take a moment to watch this video, to belong or not to belong. I have to make sure that I have given enough space between myself and another patron or another uh, commuter on the train, just to ensure that I'm not making someone uncomfortable. I have to make sure that my hands are visible when I walk into certain places so they make sure I don't, I'm not stealing. Um, I try to make sure I make eye contact with people who may or may not be security or managerial staff, just to ensure that you know I'm not here to hide anything. Uh, I watch my tone to make sure that I don't come off as threatening. Just leaving the house some days, you know, it's, it's sometimes it just keep you at home and just keep you away from everything. When I go into stores. Sometimes I get followed, <laughs> which is really annoying. And it just gives me, like, it just makes me uncomfortable. And sometimes I get anxiety, so I have to leave. Especially being a teen of color, they assume that you're doing something bad. I feel like I'm disturbing people by just being there. Like, people feel uncomfortable when I walk in. I guess I've kind of become numb to it after so many years. Like, this is just my life, and it's just something that I've gotten used to unfortunately. I think all of us make that choice at some point of, am I going to take the burden of this interaction being comfortable, or am I going to say you take the burden of this interaction being comfortable? Because what I really want is a sandwich. Do you know what I mean? I don't want to fight. I'm hungry, right? I don't want to get into this with you, and I'm really not here to teach you this. But other times, it's like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> Lesson time. Discrimination against African Americans in public spaces has a long history. In the 1960s, black and white students trying to desegregate buses were firebombed. Black patrons were routinely denied service in restaurants and hotels. I'm sorry, our management does not allow us to serve in here. And civil rights workers were dragged from lunch counters, spat upon, and beaten. Willing to be beaten for democracy, and you misuse democracy. The right to be respected in public spaces was at the heart of the civil rights movement. They keep thinking we begging them for something. We ain't begging for nothing. We're telling them what is ours right now. The freedom movement of the 1950s and 60s insisted 
that the United States live up to its constitution and allow equal access for all. Finally, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was passed, outlawing discrimination in public spaces. But changing the law doesn't always change reality. And being allowed in doesn't always mean being welcomed. To be welcomed as a customer means that not only do I allow you in, but it means that I'm glad you're here. I, I want to serve you. I want your business. And I don't draw distinctions between you and other customers in terms of your value. But it's time we talk about what it means to not be welcomed as an American citizen. It's not like I can mute my actual physical blackness, right? So I just assume that people see a particular thing when they see the color of my skin. So everything else has to be like perfect and clean and as blended in as possible. It's really just an arsenal of different masks, you know? Um, and it happens every time I, every time I leave my house. When I leave my house, regardless of where I'm going, the, I'm just leaving my house. I'm just walking out the door. I don't, I'm not walking out the door thinking, what kind of hurdle am I going to run into today? What kind of way am I going to be judged? I walk out a free man. I just do my thing. I have to make sure that I have given enough space between myself and another patron or another uh, commuter on the train, just ensure that I'm not making someone uncomfortable. I have to make sure that my hands are visible when I walk into certain places so they make sure I don't, I'm not stealing. Um, I try to make sure I make eye contact with people who may or may not be security or managerial staff, just to ensure that, you know, I'm not here to hide anything. Uh, I watch my tone to make sure that I don't come off as threatening. Just leaving the house some days, you know, it's, it's sometimes it just keep you at home and just keep you away from everything. For more than 50 years, equal treatment has been the law. Yet, as we know from cell phone videos, the nightly news, and maybe our own experience, we still have a long way to go. Why are you following? Watch this. You think I'm stealing? You follow me around the store the whole time. There she goes, she thinks I'm stealing. Your card is fake. You're going to jail. That's what I kept hearing. Unless you're spending money, uh -huh. you don't need Oh, we not, I'm not spending money Am I because uh, I'm black? Ow! Ow! You can Your manager does not like black people, honey. Yeah. Ah! Oh, my God! No, this is wrong. Oh, my God! Yeah. We just need to recognize that black people are navigating the public space differently than white people that women are navigating the public space differently than men and not use the shortcut that has been wired into your brain because of the society that we live in that tells you when you see me, you should be nervous or you should be worried. It brought me such despair to the day I recognized I had to explain this to my son, that he was gonna, that, that this muddy river of racism, he was still gonna have to walk through it. We hadn't dammed it, we hadn't dried it up. It was still there for him to go through. And I've got to somehow try to tell him, okay, off you go. The society I want to see is I want to be able to walk out the house just as free feeling as that white guy who said he doesn't worry about a thing when he walks out the door. I want to have that same expectation. Today, discrimination is against the law. It's the people and the systems that support our communities that must follow suit. No one's going to do it for us. What can you do to make our schools, our parks, our stores, our restaurants as welcoming and as inclusive as they can be? What kind of country do we want to live in? Who do we want to be? Please take a moment to pause this video and to take some time to journal and reflect. Journal and reflect on what you just watched. Did any emotions come up? 
What does it feel like to belong or not belong in our society? And then bring that down into the community level. What is something that you can do to help to start to think about how your community can begin to become welcoming and inclusive if it's not? Are there things that should be different or could be different? So please take a moment and pause the video. I would say about three to five minutes and come back when you're ready. Welcome back. Now that you've had some time to reflect on the video that we watch, there are a few questions that I'd like you to reflect and journal on as well. Does your community feel like a community for you? Do you belong in your community? Do others belong in your community? Take a moment again to pause the video and respond to these prompts. Is there something missing from your community? Are there people that might not feel a sense of belonging? Do you know the why? If not, what can you do to find out? As Brene Brown says, belonging does not require us to change who we are. It requires us to be who we are. So what are some things that we can start to do to help people to just be themselves, to show up into spaces unmasked and able to be who they are? Please take a moment and pause this video and reflect on these questions and come back. All right, welcome back. So our next power definition that we're gonna focus on is equity. So equity is the structurally and systemically knowing that everyone in an organization or everyone in a community has access to the opportunities and the resources that they need in order to thrive. Take a moment to look at these images. What do you see? On the left, we have equality where everyone's got a box, everyone's got the same thing, but is that what they all need to thrive? On the right-hand side, you see the equity where it's been distributed for everyone to have what they need in order to thrive. So not just saying everyone gets the same thing, so it's fair, but getting to what everyone needs. If you look at the bottom image, same thing. On the left side, everyone gets a box but not what they need. Looking on the right side where we're talking about equity, we've got a ramp and boxes. So now we're really talking about what does everybody need? Now I know there's been many iterations of these images and oftentimes people will say that true equity will be when the fence is gone and when the individuals aren't on the other side and they're actually sitting in the seats. But for today's purposes, I want you to really focus on these two images. What are we seeing? Is there anything that's missing? Take a minute to pause and journal your thoughts on these two images and the concept of equity. And how is it or what is it that we can start to do to make sure that we're ensuring there's access to the opportunities and the resources that people need to thrive? Not having the mentality of everybody having the same thing, so it's okay, but really thinking about what does somebody need in order to show up in this space? So I'd say take about two to three minutes and journal some of your thoughts and reflect before moving forward. All right, welcome back. So some of the things we can talk about when we're talking about equity and sharing of equity, it's seating and sharing of power. Are there times and spaces where we might need to step back and allow somebody else to step forward? When we talk about that seat at the proverbial table, are there people missing? And if we know that they're missing, how do we get them there? How do we create a space that's inviting for them to want to be there? How do we help to make the invisible visible? So if we are talking about communities and municipalities, are there people that are not at the conversation? Are there people that are not a part of the decision-making? If so, how do we help to bring those invisible individuals into the conversation so that they're visible? How do we help those that are often oppressed and marginalized feel comfortable to enter the space and to have the conversation to share their experiences and to share their opinions? 
How do we address root causes? Getting down to system levels, getting down to structure and foundation, and really thinking about what is it that's causing the system? What is it that's causing inequity? And really puts the onus on systems and not the people. We're not blaming individuals to say it's your fault that you don't have what you need. We're saying there is a system that is working, that has been in place for a very long time, that is being upheld, and we need to figure out ways to stop and pause and rethink about that system. How do we rework it so that everyone is feeling included? Are there some barriers that we're continuing to uphold? And what is it that we can do to ensure that people are feeling equitable? All right, so now is the time for you to pause the video. I'm gonna ask that you take about five minutes, a true five minutes, and take a body and a brain break. Stretch, get a snack, get something to drink, check an email, but come back in about five minutes and restart the video. I'll see you soon. All right, welcome back. I hope that your break was great. I hope you got to stretch. I hope you got something to eat, a snack, and I hope you were able to take a brain and body break. So we are going to jump right back in and we are gonna watch a video on the problem with poodle science. There's a big problem at the center of our research on weight and health. What's the problem? Well, picture a society made up of dogs. Let's say poodles are the bossiest group. They're the ones you see down at the doggy park barking at all the other dogs about how to live their lives in order to be healthy. But the problem is, poodles think that every other kind of dog is just a really big, a really small, or a really fat poodle, when actually the other dogs aren't even poodles at all. They're terriers, or mastiffs, or greyhounds, or labs. And all of the thousands of different dog breeds have different lifespans and different health risks. Each one has evolved to use food differently for different specialties at surviving. Some for staying warm, some for running fast, and some for being strong. They're meant to be different sizes and weights. So the poodles think the mastiffs should lose weight, but a starving mastiff never becomes a poodle. The poodles don't understand that dogs come in many more sizes than they can imagine in their poodle-centric ways. So this becomes a problem when it comes to poodle science. When the poodles did their weight and health research and made the claim that lighter dogs are healthier and live longer, they weren't comparing thinner poodles and fatter poodles. They were comparing poodles and mastiffs. So the recommendation for mastiffs to lose weight is based on the false assumption that if all dogs reach poodle weight, then all dogs will have poodle health. But once again, a starved mastiff just isn't a poodle. This poodle science doesn't even test whether a starved mastiff lives longer than a mastiff who has enough to eat, because one would have to compare mastiffs who maintain poodle weight to mastiffs that maintain mastiff weight. And it turns out that starving mastiffs regain weight, which after all is a much better thing than starving. But the poodles can only see that regain as a failure of mastiff self-discipline. Look, poodles are great, but poodle-centric health policy is a nightmare. Good science tells us that it's better to recognize and respect the ways we're different, because how we're treated, having good friends, having access to decent food, a place to play, restful sleep, and medical care make a huge difference in our health and longevity for all of us, whatever our size. Okay. Take a moment and pause. What can be learned from the problem of Puno science? What did you learn? What are you taking away? Please take two to three minutes to reflect and journal on the problem with poodle science. What did you notice in the video? How does this apply to community thoughts? How does this apply to the work that's happening in municipalities?
After you've journaled your thoughts on poodle science, I want you to pause again. And I want you to develop a list of reasons as to why equity should matter in your community. So not only have we learned the importance of equity, but why should it matter to your community? When you think about it, I want you to consider this inclusion in a variety of community contexts, whether it's including educational systems, the healthcare system, the judicial system, employment, and the sustainability of your community. This quote by Mickey Kendall says, equity means making access to opportunity easier, not deciding which opportunities they deserve. So using the Poodle Science video and this quote, I'd like you to take a moment to develop a list of reasons as to why equity should matter to your community. Okay, and welcome back. So our power definition that we're shifting into now is inclusion. And inclusion is the ability of the community to ensure that all social identities are fully integrated into the cultural dynamics, leadership, and the decision-making structures. The purpose and help of inclusion is that it produces happier people. When you feel like you're included, when you feel like you can show up as yourself to the work or into your community, you're happier. The cultural, the cultural aspect of the community starts to shift because it becomes innovative. There's diversity in thought, people are feeling good about themselves, and they're really feeling included. You also will have a more educated and well-versed community. The group morale, community morale, starts to increase when people feel like they can show up as their true self and be able to be a part of discussions that are really impacting change. Are there barriers that exist in your communities right now? Or are there systems that are being upheld that are not inclusive? Are we creating spaces for people to come unmasked? And as the Brene Brown quote we read talked about, we're allowing people to be who they are. So I want you to take a moment to think about these questions. What are the barriers that exist? What is being upheld that is causing people to not feel included? Are we creating spaces for people to come unmasked? Take a moment to journal your thoughts and come back when you're ready. All right. Other things that I want you to focus on today is with so many cultures in our communities, I want you to take a moment to list the ways that inclusion can be fostered or improved in your community. Develop a short list and think about diversity as a fact. Inclusion is an act. So diversity is something that exists, but inclusion is something that has to be done in order for that to show. So pause this video and really think about how do we start to include people? How do we start to improve? What's missing and what needs to be done? I'd say take about two minutes and then come back. Okay, so as we move forward, we're thinking about the change process. So now that we know what's needed, how do we start to make the change and what does that process look like? So there's three main phases when we're talking about change. The current state, that's the normal routine that we're used to. So that is status quo. Then there's the transition state. This is the point where people break away from the everyday processes that they're used to. And this is when they begin to implement new processes and a new way of doing things. So we're hoping that today we start to move into the transition state, starting to think about how do we implement new processes and new ways of doing things. The last phase is the future state. That is the state when the desired change is the new normal and people have consistently altered their behavior to reflect change. So at the end of today's workshop, my hope is that you will be prepared to move into the transition state and really start to think about what are some new things that we can do. And my hope and goal for you is that in time, your community or your organization will move into the future state. 
how we think about change can have a significant impact on how our community will react. Most people are going to view change as a threat. When change is announced, people automatically are defensive and immediately will become concerned about their roles within the community, concerned about whether they may lose their jobs, concerned about their communities, their companies. And it's really understandable considering how many companies have been forced to right size in the past few years. So a lot of times there have been change that have been forced and pushed on. So it makes people nervous when they hear change. But ideally, you want your community members to be in a frame of mind when they're asking, how can help change, how can change help us to be stronger? How will it impact my position? Is not something that we want them to focus on, but wanting them to think about how can we change things so that we're becoming more inviting and more welcoming. When they are a part of the change process, it feels less abrasive and it feels like they're really helping to make a change. Sometimes there's tension because some people wanna move from the current stage to the future state. That doesn't happen overnight at all, and it's dangerous. It takes time, and that's why the transition stage is important because the transition stage is where you take the time to learn, to understand what's needed, and again, thinking about that equity, what are the opportunities, what are the resources that people need to thrive? So taking the time to be okay with your transition state is really helpful. We're talking about this as a process because change is just that. It takes time. There's no quick fix of going from current state to future state. It really is important to focus on the transition state, take the time to really learn and understand your community and really move yourself through the process and be okay with pausing and taking time if your community needs it. I want you to take a moment to take a good look at this diagram. What do you notice about this change process? What are the things that you see? What are things that resonate with you? So I'm gonna ask that you pause this video and take about three to five minutes to focus on this diagram and take some notes about what you see. All right, welcome back. So this change process diagram is an image by Virginia Satir, who is the pioneer of family therapy. And it really talks through about how an individual really experiences change. So at the top, we start with the old status quo or what we would consider the, con the current state. That is the moment where things currently stand, where your community is now, where your organization is now and currently how things are done. It's a starting point before change is introduced. As you see on the diagram here, there's a foreign element. That's when change is introduced and that's when things begin to shift. We talked a little bit on the last slide about resistance, feeling forced and defensiveness. So when we talk about resistance, change is normally created as a foreign element. So this can be something like, new technology being offered, a new process, a new change in your job, et cetera. It normally leads to this phase resistance. It can be encountered at many levels in any organizations. It can be from CEOs to frontline employees. Anyone can face resistance. And it's usually accompanied by denial. Questioning of why are we doing this? Why can't things just stay the same? This feels uncomfortable for me, I don't understand. If you're able to move past the resistance phase, what you move into next is chaos. This is the phase where emotions start to truly reign. There's always gonna be negative reactions and there will always be a dip in productivity. So as you see on this process, we're starting to go downward. So that's that dip we're talking about. The only way to move through this is to establishing a listening framework. Again, taking the time to pause and really listen, ask questions and, and consider things like a support system. What do people need in order to make it to the other side of this diagram? What do people need in order to feel comfortable to continue to move through this process? Not saying that we're going to pause 
and return back to status quo because it's comfortable, but saying that we're gonna move forward, but what do you need? How do we help? As you continue to build those support systems and move on, you get to this transforming idea or transformative idea. This is where the actual change starts to begin. And as you see on this diagram, we're starting to move upward. So yes, productivity had dipped for a little bit and that's uncomfortable and caused chaos, but now we're starting to move our way up. This is where it begins, where people begin to believe that the change is meaningful, that it's helpful, and it feels like something that they can adopt and not something that's forced on them. And as we continue through this, you see in the model, there's a tree stump that they're climbing on and they're continuing to climb so that we can get to integration. So integration is where productivity really starts to improve. So we're out of that dip and again, getting ourselves up. Talking about our group morale starts to improve, practice begins to crystallize and new habits and knowledge are formed. And you're starting to see, if you're looking again at the diagram, there's that line through the middle of time. This takes time and that's okay. And as you're moving to the integration stage, we're finding that performance is getting higher. So that final stage is also the future state of what we talked about in the phase of change, which is your new status quo. Change becomes the norm. It is adopted across broad spectrums and it is complete. Things are in a new place, things look different and performance starts to shift. The main takeaway from this chart and diagram is that this takes time. This is a process and not a plan. So the analogy I like to use when I talk about Virginia Satir's change process is that sometimes we decide we're gonna clean out our basement. We pull everything out and then we're stuck trying to figure out, do we have enough time to do this? Does this make sense? You can either put everything back and leave it as is, or you can create a plan. So you can work through the resistance and transforming ideas. Okay, I'm gonna do a little bit of this. I'm gonna figure out and sort some things and see what's needed until I get it back to a place where it feels better, it's cleaner, it looks the way that I want it. It's okay to take time, it's okay to pause, and it's okay to sort of stay if you need to in the transforming idea stage where you're really asking the questions and creating support. You want people to be a part of this process because in the end it helps the entire community. Take a moment to pause this video. I would say take about three to five minutes and really highlight and focus on the change process. What are you seeing? What are some things that you can begin to do in your community? And what is it that's needed in order to move this work forward? Please pause again and come back in a few. Okay, welcome back. So we are nearing the end of our workshop today and I'm going to leave you with some bridge work. We don't call it homework because our hope is that this begins to make connections from this work dot to what you'll start to do in your organizations and your community. The first piece of this is acknowledgement. What are the, some of the challenges that your community is facing? Where is the resistance in your community? What are some of the powerful unexamined ideas at play in your communities, your towns, or your city. So that's the first stage, acknowledgement. Really being okay with saying, what are the challenges? What are we doing? What is the resistance? What are the inequities that exist? And what are the systems that are upholding them? The next step is you'll think about an environmental scan. Are there policies, practices, or procedures that are at play here that are advancing inequity? Are there specific groups that may be excluded from your community? If the answers are yes to any of those questions, what can you do? How do you create a support system? How do you find out what those barriers are? If you already know what they are, what are some changes that you can start to make? The last step is opportunities and gaps. Do a SWOT analysis. So you're thinking about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And do an analysis of your town. Think about what is it that we do well? What are the things that we're not getting right? 
where they are, where are their opportunities for change? And what are the threats that can dismantle our change process? So take a moment to reflect on these questions and use this as you start to begin to have conversations. So the last journal that I want you to do is any insights or aha moments. Was there something that stuck out to you today? What are some of your final reflections? Are there questions that you have that you'd like to talk through with your sustainable CT coach? Are there questions that you'd like to explore? Are there things that you're like, I get it and I'm ready to make change? Are there things where you're saying, I know this isn't right and I need to figure it out. Take a moment to pause and think about belonging. Do I feel like I belong in my community? And is that the same for others? Equity, does everyone in our community have what they need in order to thrive? Diversity, not just thinking about diversity and the diversity of people, but also the diversity of thought. Think about diversity in different ways in your community, whether we're talking about socioeconomic status, we're talking about healthcare systems, the education system, the judicial system, broadening our scope and thinking about multiculturalism as well. And then inclusivity. Are we being inclusive? Are people able to show up without their mask on and really be themselves? If we're not creating those spaces for people, what is it that we can start to do to help them to feel included in our community and to feel that sense of belonging that we saw in Maslow's hierarchy of need as something that we all need? We all want to feel like we are a part of our community. So what can we do today to help them to start to feel that way if they don't? I want to thank you for joining us today. For more information on future educational workshops, please take time to visit the Sustainable CT website. I have been so pleasured and so happy to be here with you today. I hope that you take away from this workshop some of what we talked about in the desired outcomes of really feeling prepared to have conversations, to really look inward and start to do the work and to start making change. Thank you.